Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. And I'm Jenna. And this is your culture guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we have an amazing, out of this world rundown. We, we've been going through season one and all our favorite stuff from from season one throughout every episode we've talked about all the great music that has happened in every single episode but there's one person one amazing musician that we have skipped every week because we're going to give him his own episode this is our jan hammer spectacular the man the myth the legend that defined music for the 80s and in Miami Vice. I have to say, guys, I can't be more excited than to find out about the mysterious man that is Jan Hammer. Yeah, you know, and just tearing through the research, I'm actually, I'm a little nervous for this show because I want to <laughs> do, I, I just want to do it justice. This man has, this man has been working nonstop for about three decades. When I think back on Miami Vice, Obviously, we talk about Phil Collins and all, and the other musicians that are routine, or actually, it's basically Genesis. Genesis, Phil Collins, and Peter Gabriel, who are routine musicians on Miami Vice. But Jan Hammer is probably the most important part of all of the music in, in every episode. Before we get started, we'd like to check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. And guys, I have something I wanted to talk about today. I have almost one-year-old little girl, and she is just now getting to being able to talk she has four words in her repertoire she can say dada kitty tree and doggy now my other two children who are much older they all said dad first so i'm three for three i'm batting a thousand in this game right now i have a feeling that if i pop out eight or nine more i might continue the trend here of always being number one do you just get up in the middle of the night and slowly <laughs> whisper to her like dada dada <laughs> I, gotta, I, gotta tell I was you, fully I expecting you, you to say one of the words was a swear word, too. <laughs> I, I feel like I come from a place of authority and knowing that you're absolutely the kind of person to do that. Oh, absolutely. Every chance I get, I point to everything and say, Dada, Dada. So she thinks that everything is just called that word. <laughs> <laughs> but but I will say in this this time, because of the first two, they both said Dada first. And I will say that it, there's some debate on whether or not my youngest said Dada first. The debate between that and Kitty, but I worked. I actually did work hard to get her to say "mama," and she's not only is she refusing, she she doesn't say it. It's almost like she's refusing to say "mama." I will ask her like, "Hey, where's mama? Can you say mama?" She'll look right at Melissa and go, "Dada." <laughs> 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 See what Maybe you gotta just... do. What you gotta do is you gotta give Melissa a nickname that she can call her, like Captain <laughs> Squishy Pants. <laughs> well, you know it's getting even worse now because then she runs through the other words that she knows. I'm like, no, not that. Dad. She goes, Kitty? No, not Kitty. <laughs> tree? No, not tree. Who is this stranger standing in the hallway? <laughs> <laughs> but but if mom's not around, as soon as something happens, she looks down the stairs like, where's mom? God <laughs> help me. Where's mom? <laughs> 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 All right. Well, let's uh, let's dig into Jan Hammer. I, he's got 30 years of history that we got to get through on this man. So let's go ahead and head on over there and get into the music. All right, John, I think we are all anxiously awaiting the history of. Of Jan Hammer. All right. Well, let's start in April 17th, 1948, in Prague, Czechoslovakia, when a young Jan Hammer Jr. is born. Junior? Yeah, so <laughs> thought that was funny. We're going to start with a little background on his parents. Jan Hammer's mother, Vlasta Kruchova. I am probably butchering this. Yeah, I don't think any of us would stand a chance in that. Mm -mm. But she was actually a well-known Czech singer and actually pretty popular across Czechoslovakia. And she how actually... I, can I just ask really quick how mom was Vlasta Prukova, but dad was Jan Hammer? <laughs> 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 Was, so was this that is where for the check or <laughs> <laughs> no? So our 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 so basically our story begins is that Prochova, his mother, met Jan Hammer at his concert. She was watching his band, and they would later ask her to join their band. Mm. Jan Hammer Senior, being a vibraphone and bass player. This is starting off so strong. This is starting <laughs> off so strong. A vibraphone? That sounds like a joke instrument. <laughs> so also a vibraphone resembles a xylophone, basically, except something plugs into it, I think. Mm. So I also imagine that Jan Hammer Sr. asked his 
future wife to be in the band, not because he had any plans on marrying her. He was just thinking of boning down. It'd be something that'd be something to say to get her to come over to, to his place. Next thing you know, she's in the band. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where it gets even weirder because no, she's doing pretty good for herself because Jan Hammer Sr. is also a cardiologist. Ah, huh. wow. He's a doctor. <laughs> what a catch. So, you know, I just yes. really don't understand. Like, if someone were to wiki our lives, it would not be nearly <laughs> as interesting as this. Where no, it's like, no, oh, yeah, dad was, a, was a, a brain surgeon and played many instruments. <laughs> like, he was stellar at the air yeah. guitar. And no, no, ours is a Hammer. Being a rocket scientist. Yeah. Ours, and, ours is, is two sentences. Dad worked at the same company for 30 years. Mom was stay-at-home mom. End of wiki. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay, guys, we're going to have to create a pack to go on and create our own wikis, okay? Uh-huh. I'll, ba- I'll back you up on whatever you write. You back me up, okay? Uh-huh. Okay, so Jan Hammer Sr. was a cardiologist and part-time bass player. His mom would actually become pretty famous for being a jazz singer after joining the band. And they would have two kids, Jan Hammer Jr., and Andrea Hammer. God, man, Hammer's such an awesome last name. I know, it's so amazing. <laughs> it's so amazing. They would routinely have musicians over at the house, even having Miles Davis over one point in time uh, wow. just to jam while he's growing up. So by the age of four, Jan Hammer was playing the piano. And by the age of 14, him and a jazz trio were even starting to tour Eastern Europe. That's amazing because we're talking in the early 50s when Miles Davis would have been, or the mid 50s would have been. So that's like, that's during the Eastern Bloc. That's post communist Czechoslovakia. That's, that's actually amazing that that even happened. Yeah. So, well, that's, it's, it's not post communist yet because. He would start going to school at the Prague Academy of Music Arts, but he would end up leaving school when the Warsaw Pact invaded on August 20th, 1968. Yeah, and the Warsaw, I did some research on the Warsaw Pact, and that is that is an amazingly interesting story. And I have a ton of notes. I'm going to try and boil this down to like just a few minutes long on what, on what the Warsaw Pact invasion was in 1968. First of all, the Warsaw Pact was formed in 1955. It was led by Soviet, and guys, this is like right in my wheelhouse because I'm such a history nerd so this is like <laughs> mm-hmm. i'm trying to control I can hear myself in your voice. As like, I go like you're this. getting excited <laughs> uh. the warsaw pact was formed in 1955 and, and the soviets would say it was because they were responding to west germany joining nato that they decided to form essentially their own version of nato well and so in 1955 they, they signed the warsaw pact which basically aligned all of the eastern bloc countries into a single nato like unit so we have bulgaria czechoslovakia east germany hungary poland romania albania and then of course the soviets oh, but so it was this was like reaction to the paris pact yes okay yeah a- absolutely so this was and they would say it's, it's in response to some things like that but it's really about being able to build their military along the eastern bloc and being in control of all of these countries the warsaw pact lasted until 1991 in 1990 both east germany and poland withdrew from the warsaw pact obviously east germany has reasons because the berlin wall fell fell november 3rd 1989 so they were already a in post-communism era albania had withdrawn in 1968 because of the warsaw invasion the warsaw pact invasion so there's there was some strife within these countries but it was just a way for the soviets to control all of these all of these countries in 1968 when the warsaw pact invasion happened there was a change in these countries in in albania and czechoslovakia and hungary where they were starting to incorporate more democracy ideals into socialism and so in 1968 there was a a change had been happening in czechoslovakia to pull themselves out of an economic recession because the soviets believed that industrialization is what fed the economy for for communism but didn't really fit what czechoslovakia needed to buoy their their economy so in january 1968 a reformist named Alexander Dubček, I believe is how it's pronounced. He was elected the first secretary, and he immediately allowed more freedoms of speech, media, and travel. That was those were his big things that he was allowed to do. Obviously, the Soviets were really against that, especially the free speech and media stuff, because immediately the media outlets in Czechoslovakia started publishing stuff about bad things about the Soviets. So during a treaty 
or not treaty, but like negotiations with Czechoslovakia, where the Soviets were negotiating with them and talking to them about the changes that were happening. The Soviets, using the Warsaw Pact, invaded Czechoslovakia during the meeting. So all the leaders were in a meeting and then they invaded the Invasion would last until August with Dubček immediately asking the Czech, the Czechoslovakian people to concede and not to fight back because it's just how powerful the Soviets were. And they removed him from power and they put in a more friendly regime to the Soviets in Czechoslovakia. But in that time, after the Soviets took it invaded Czechoslovakia in the Warsaw Pact invasion, about 300,000 people fled from Czechoslovakia and the Western countries, especially during that time during the Eastern Bloc and the Cold War. They just kind of opened doors and allowed these people to leave Czechoslovakia and come to them. Yeah. And so, I mean, that kind of brings us to what the Amherst did, was they chose to leave Czechoslovakia. And in a very rock star kind of way, Jan Hammer actually performed one last show at the domicile in Munich for leaving for the U.S. He performed there with his jazz trio and even recorded a live album from there. So kind of a one last, like, here we go, which I'm in a, on a side note, if I ever leave the country, I wish I could do something like that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. You're like, hey, and I'm out, bitches, and just drop the mic and then just walk right onto an airplane and leave. <laughs> yeah, so, so Jan would receive scholarship to the Berkeley College of Music in Boston. So Berkeley with two E's and a Y, not to be I... confused with the one in California. And at the same time, his dad would accept a one-year fellowship, a research fellowship in Washington, D.C. So they would all move to America, but only Jan would stay in America. His family would eventually, after the one-year fellowship returned to Czechoslovakia received all kinds of problems from the communist regime. regime. Jan Hammer Sr. was was allowed to practice medicine when he returned and his mom wasn't allowed to record any new records and his sister andrea wasn't allowed to study at the prague conservatory because wow. they were really suspicious about their time living in the u.s um, wow that sucks yeah so yeah. like and then of course they're under constant watch so they get back to czechoslovakia they're not allowed to do any of their stuff and then realize like oh yeah and by the way the the army is watching us, so we can't leave now either. Yeah, and so only Jan Jr. would stay in the U.S. So, and that's pretty much the early life of Jan Hammer before he started really breaking out in music. Of course. You know, and you mentioned it too. It's like, of course, people who are famous or, you know, have been famous for a long time. Of course, when you look back in their history, it's like, oh, yeah, he's been a fucking rock star his entire goddamn life. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, pretty much, you know, <laughs> which is, by the way, Google a picture of him, because if you see a picture of him, you're not going to think rock star. <laughs> this goes back to what we were talking about with our boy Phil Collins last night. I'm mm -hmm. telling you, like him in his polo, he looks like he's ready to pull up Very a minivan similar and pick someone up patterns. from soccer practice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, you know what? I don't know what the deal is from the 80s with that. We're, we obviously have a harder time with that now. Where That's from a bygone era where it's like, oh, yeah, it's just about the music. But I guess it's also because not a lot of people were watching TV. They were still getting their music just from the radio. They had no idea what people actually looked like. Now it's it's half of your act is is how, how you look because stream, live streaming and YouTube and Instagram and your Twitter feed, not including your, every, all the music videos for your stuff. Like, I guess it's just an era that that didn't matter any. Well. I mean, I think a lot that has to do with, with why we don't see as much of it now is not because there aren't as many people who sort of fit that profile, but they are behind the scenes. Like, they mm -hmm. write all of the music, and we just turned more toward a type of popular music that doesn't rely on, like... like it has a face and then it has a talent and they're not necessarily well, connected <laughs> like they are in many cases two different groups of people that are just working in tandem to produce a product that'll sell that's true that's true and, and to kind of expand on that one now we're going to start getting into jan hammer the musician the professional musician and i think what it's going to show is that if you're a really, really good musician, it doesn't matter what you look like, uh, because apparently whatever you work on works. That's true. Uh, That's true. So, yeah. So so we've gotten through Jane Hammer, the kid. He's now made it to America. He's obviously got a great mu musical background, both parents being musicians. He comes to the United States. He's ready to start kicking ass. Where does Jan go from here? Yeah. 
we're going to jump to the decade of the 70s. Upon completing school, the Berkeley uh, College of Music, he would spend a year touring with jazz artist Sarah Va- uh, Vaughan. Vaughan. Thank you. Uh, uh, that's I was my trying guess. to figure out. Yeah, that's my guess as well. And he would also re- be recording with artist Elvis Jones and Jeremy Steig. And if none of those names really sound familiar to you, it's because they're jazz artists and they there's very deep jazz culture that is very eclectic. And so I wouldn't expect you to know any of those names. They're just they were really big influential jazz musicians at the time. Yeah, and I'm you know you know John. You know, uh, you know my stance on jazz, so I'm just kind of letting it yes. slide in this episode, not bringing up, you know, my my controversial dislike of jazz. So I'm just let just to know, like I'm letting you slide on this one. It's brave of you to year. admit that you're wrong in your opinion, Dominic. It really is. <laughs> yes, yes. People who enjoy music and talent, you know, they they're forgiving you. Don't worry. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm just saying I enjoy Miley Cyrus more than I enjoy jazz. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, John, should we, like, mute Dominic for the rest of the episode? Or... I kind of think we should, at least I... for the next, you know, 15 or so minutes. I, I feel like we're drawing some real lines in the family here that we may never come back from this. Oh, I, I've accepted long ago he doesn't appreciate good music because, because he has the same feeling when it comes to blues music as yes. well. Blues is the creation of rock and roll. Anything he could possibly like came from blues. So I just mm-hmm. need um, to know, like, I can't take much more of blues this. Blues and jazz. I know, I, I've already known that you like horrible, horrible taste in movies, okay? That you have just, like, no quality taste in movie at all. But now, you're ruining music as well? <laughs> like, is nothing sacred to you? Look, look, look. Let, let's get real here. My whole world with music and movies exists in two things. Just put on some Taylor Swift, and I'll watch Guardians of the Galaxy over and over again. And I'm good for the rest of my life. I don't know what else you want from me. I think it's a little unfair that you bring T-Swift into this because everyone loves Taylor, okay? Actually, That's not I'm even lying. Okay. Taylor transcends. <laughs> Moving on. Rude of you to group her talent with the likes of Miley. Thank you. We'll have more. Moving words. on. Back to some actual artists. Um, (laughs) after spending a year touring he would move to lower manhattan and join the original lineup of the mahavishnu orchestra with guitarist john mclaughlin violinist jerry goodman bassist rick laird and drummer billy cobham yeah uh, in 1971. So I did a little reading on the orchestra, um, and I think that it's it's fair to point out first that John McLaughlin is known as Mahavishnu. So like he was really the impetus for a lot of this, or like that's like a nickname or something out of it. And Jan and him synced up, and he was then part of the original lineup, and he played with them from correct me if I'm wrong, but 71 to 73 when they took their first break. And the you had some impressive numbers, I know, on like how many shows that they played with that original group for the like the first what's known as the first Mahavishnu Orchestra. There has since been other eras um, where they picked back up from 74 to 75. Then again with a new lineup in 76 and then back again uh, with three group of lineups from 84 to 87 they actually even very recently announced like a final tour this was around the time that billy cobham passed away so this was like october like last month that he passed away and that they announced that they were going to be doing like a final reunion tour and playing i I think it's mostly u.s so what what so, kind of music is this? What are they? Me, what is what is the orchestra play? Okay, so let me break down the Mahavishnu Orchestra real, uh, really quick for you guys. It's, it's Mahavishnu it basically is the divine of Vishnu, uh, meaning the 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 Hinduist god Vishnu. Mm. John McLaughlin, who is pretty much 
the main guy, uh, the the guy who's kind of held that group together, they perform kind of a psychedelic jazz and progressive rock style music. But it, it it's no singing. It's all this sounds an awful purely lot instrumental. Like, purely instrumental, exactly. So it, it, you know, like the electric electric light orchestra. This is the Mahavishnu orchestra. It's mm. a similar all instrumental band. They did a lot of psychedelic jazz, a lot of experimental jazz, you know, that really kind of funky stuff. So this sounds um, an awful lot like a type of music that in the 60s or the 70s, people coked out of their brains and then popping mushrooms thought sounded fantastic. And then once we got... Oh, yeah. And, this and, is, and now that we're later looking back, like, oh, man, what a mess that was. This is <laughs> a, totally a band that you would see if you were on acid. This is where... <laughs> This is the band that you would go see. And this goes back to talking about, you know, these eclectic artists who are very appreciated in their fields, but not very well known in mainstream. But I will say. To the numbers side, in the two years, sorry, in the two years Jan Hammer was in the band, they performed 530 shows. Damn. uh, With Hammer being an early pioneer playing the mini Moog Sim synthesizer that is an impressive, i'm just gonna let that one hang there for, that's an for impressive that last number part. of shows that is hustling and dominic i will say that like the the thought of like this was just like a like a lost era like ooh, <laughs> we were okay john mclaughlin is considered to be one of the best guitarists of all time mm. and there were a ton of other artists that got their rise out of working with him as well like jeff beck who I think is going to come up again um, with the work that he did later on with, very with Jan. Shortly, yes. Yeah. But others like that passed through, they did when they very first got started out, it was shortly after working with, or John had been working with Miles Davis just to cross paths between that again, but definitely like strong talents, you know, for people who appreciate music, there's, there's, there's hmm. a, a connection there. It just, it just all yeah. sounds very much to me like that scene in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas when the guy walks in on Johnny Depp trying to sniff all the coke off the dude's arm in the bathroom. That's just that's, uh, this, that's what this all screams to me. But, you know, I'm just a simple man. <laughs> okay, so I want to get to the part that no one seemed to point out. Did I mention he was an early pioneer playing the mini Moog? Sort synthesizer. I didn't see. I didn't attach. I didn't attack that because I don't. Even, I can't even tell you what the hell it is. Yeah. Can any of you guys even give me like? Can you guys even guess close to what that is? I'm, I guess that it looks something like a harmonica or a sound flute, like one of the what are the, what are those <laughs> r- recorders or whatever? <laughs> yeah, the ones that can make the brown noise. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jenna. I was going the same thing. Like, whoops, Jenna. I was going with the same thing. I was thinking. Like what are, what are those harmonica things where it's got the spring and when they play it goes like doing, 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 when they play it what is that thing? <laughs> okay, so uh, 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 to answer the question, a Moog synthesizer is basically a combination of a recorder and like a um, organ. Jenna, you are so close. Yes. <laughs> yeah so it's got like, like a little piano part but it's also got like a little recording part up top and yeah it's goofy mm-hmm. looking do you so. play it like, like a theremin do you just like wave your hands over the top of it and it makes like all kinds of weird noises i didn't see oh, yeah, i didn't I... actually watch anything of them playing it so i didn't actually see how you play it but i saw like pictures of it it yeah. looks very complicated I'm now looking at pictures of it, and it looks incredibly complex. Like what you would imagine the first IBM looked like. (laughs) Maybe someone someone who sits down in front of that and connects calls for people. (laughs) Like old school where they just unplug and replug in. Just a switchboard. Yeah. Okay, so Jan Hammer would play his farewell, farewell concert with Mahavishnu Orchestra on December 30th, 1973. And so he would go on after that recording albums with Jerry Goodman and John Abercrombie before he would start his solo career in 74. So he would release his first album, The First Seven Days. And knowing knowing his... Jan Hammer's work ethic, if the album is called The First Seven Days, the album means he recorded it in seven days and there's 39 songs on the album. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, e- even uh, like, like even more than that. So, okay. He produced and recorded the album 
at the studio he built in his upstate New York farmhouse, which he named Red Gate Studios. And he's recorded there for the rest of his career. Which, oh, which sounds so, an awful lot like Pink Floyd, uh, Roger Waters. That's essentially what, what yeah. uh, he did, too. Yeah, so basically, not only did he release his first album in 74, but he built an entire studio at his house in order to record it yeah. in 74. John, yeah. was was our boy Jan religious, or like did he just go through a phase? Because I'm reading the track listing on the first seven days, and it sounds so biblical. <laughs> like the, you know, it, 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 just so that we're clear, it goes darkness, earth in search of a sun, then to light and sun, then oceans and continents, plants and trees, the animals, the people, and then the seventh day. Based on what I, I, I've i heard so far about Jane Hammer, it sounds an awful like he's the inspiration for, my, for Minority Report. So he's, he has all these visions of what's happen, of what's going to happen. Like, should, we be, um, should we be reading our tea leaves while we listen to this? Or? So that, that, that has to do with actual like jazz recordings. A lot of times, like one of Miles Davis's most famous recordings is called autumn leaves it, it's the because the the song itself is pretty much a is basically a description or like when you listen to it you kind of picture what you're um, what you're hearing is based on like a season or like a, a certain scene or scenario uh, after uh, releasing his album he would put together the jan hammer group in 1976 so that he could tour um, Seems like such a missed opportunity but it was it called hammer time <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he didn't know it was teed up for him, but know. he didn't know. <laughs> Just such a missed opportunity. His band name should so, all be puns around a hammer. Like, like there's, there's no excuse why his all his album names or band names or anything like that aren't hammer puns. Like when he went through his hard rock phase and he was hard hitting hammer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the group, the group, the Jan Hammer group, would release four albums, two of their own albums. Oh yeah. And, and melodies and then they would release two albums with jeff beck entitled wired and jeff beck with the with the jan hammer group live jeff beck being of the yardbirds fame for mm -hmm. uh, anyone wondering jeff beck would actually perform a lot with jan hammer over the years they would work together a lot on different jeff beck projects throughout jeff Beck's solo career uh, i believe now i have to go back in my uh, without going back into my notes i believe that they actually met when he was in boston going to college mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. why they have a relationship so after releasing those four albums in 1977 would record on a myriad of pr projects with Al Di Miola, including Elegant Gypsy, Casino, Splendid Hotel, and Electric Rendezvous, and also tour with Al Di Mi Miola. Yeah, you know, and also, like, and I miss with Jeff Beck, but so far he's worked with some amazing guitar guitarists too you know, that seems like that's a common thread for him that people who are exceptional at the guitar find jan hammer yeah yeah and that's what it seems like he really kind of works with a lot of really good guitarists and he works just with a, just a ton of different people over his career so in in 1978 hammer w would return to solo work with the release of his album black sheep and then form a new band called hammer it's funny <laughs> it's like anytime he wants to release an album he just puts a band together so this version uh the band hammer they wrote and recorded three songs for jeff Beck album there and back in 1980 and put, wrote a song for the British TV show The Tube. Uh, I'm sorry, he wrote the theme song Star Cycle for the British TV show The Tube. Please and tell that me that his, his his album, so you said he had an album called There and Back, right? Jeff Beck's album There and oh, Back. Okay. okay, hopefully that album is about a a small a small band of little people that venture out into a big world and search to make the world a safer place <laughs> <laughs> ending in a battle with a dragon <laughs> that sounds awfully familiar dominic uh -huh. i can't help but wonder where the inspiration for that came from i don't know yeah yeah that would be it's a great idea right. you should really lock it down <laughs> I guess I'm suggesting that Jan Hammer and Jeff Beck both appreciate people with hairy feet. <laughs> yes. And that brings us to the 1980s. 
which once again, Shane and Hammer would form a new group, a duo named Shone and Hammer with Santana and Journey guitarist Neil Sean, recording album Untold Passions in 1981 and Here to Stay in 1982. And again, so again, another amazing guitarist. Yeah, so another amazing guitarist wants to work with Jan Hammer, so they form a band, release two albums, and then Jan Hammer goes on to do whatever the hell else he wants to do. Because he's like the Highlander. Um, he just roams around the world trying to find, you know, solving up other people's problems and he can't die. <laughs> yes. So from uh, 83 to 84, he would do ben- he would do nine benefit concerts with Arms, which is Action Research into Multiple Sclerosis, playing with Eric Clapton, Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck and Joe Cocker. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. once again, amazing guitarist, amazing guitarist, amazing guitarist, amazing guitarist. Yep. And, and so, then Jan Hammer working his yes. working his synth. And then in 1984, <laughs> he would contribute to Styx first album city slicker mick Uh, jagger's first solo album she's the boss and jeff beck's album flash which includes hammer song escape which won a 1985 emmy uh grammy so so here we are we're on the precipice of making it to miami vice and jane hammer is a freaking superstar yeah he isn't some just Dude, some guy and- that they found to do music for miami vice he didn't even need to do miami vice he's some mega superstar that they were able to convince to do the music for the show who knows why he ever agreed to do miami vice so i want to throw out a comparison there for the younger generation and so and maybe a little teach a, a little bit of stuff that you guys might not know so randy jackson who was the judge on american idol he played in journey but he was like mm-hmm. a bass player who played in like all kinds of different bands he was a lot like jan hammer where he would just go and work with guys during their album and he'd play bass for him yeah and so and then he became throughout his career he also became a producer and he would produce Produce all kinds of big name artists as well, and Jan Hammer is is very much in that same way. He is he is just like if you need a keyboard a keyboardist or a composer, you want to work with Jan Hammer, and that's uh, like with whatever project, whether as we'll find out, whether it's musicians, TV. So he was actually a big name, and he was he was building up to start producing stuff as well. And so I, this I feel is, I feel though that. There's a missed opportunity here where he, because he's, he, you know, he got into doing a lot of synthesizing and doing a lot of production and stuff like that. But at some point in time, he's got to hear his, his dad calling to him. It's like, son, son, play the xylophone. Play more <laughs> xylophone. <laughs> so, moving into the Miami Vice years, he would compose three original scores for three motion picture soundtracks, as well as scores for documentaries and made-for-TV movies, commercials, and radio station IDs, and then at the same time, hook up with Michael Mann, for the Miami Vice series. So basically, so if you were alive anytime after 1975, for sure you have heard Jan Hammer somewhere. Yeah, and I mean, if you were if you were alive in the 80s and you listened to the radio, you heard Jan Hammer, you just didn't know it. Every yeah. like radio ID, like all that music that the you know, yeah. 90, yeah. Uh, 80s soft rock, like that's yeah. Jan Hammer. <laughs> yeah, 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 or commercials or movies or whatever the hell else. He's just doing everything. He's he's it seems like it's got to be like an Andy Warhol factory. There's no way this man is doing all of this work. There's got to be a team of people that he has chained up in that studio at his house that's why it's at his house that way no one can know all the people he's got chained together in a sweatshop that turn it out radio <laughs> segues and tv Please, commercials and Hammer, stuff. i just want to go home <laughs> <laughs> take pity it's almost christmas <laughs> you get all that moogan right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, and then that, that leads us into the Miami Vice years. So, that brings us, uh, so, Miami Vice's soundtrack, believe it or not, hit number one on pop charts in 1985. And yes. would eventually go on to be quadruple platinum. Oh, four wow. times platinum. 
Wow. Stan, wow. S- selling more than 4 million copies. Yeah, I was trying to find some like albums to do comparison, but it is there's a big cutoff at that 4 to 5 million range. Mm-hmm. Um, and I cannot so, wait. If, if you've been listening to our sister show, This Week in Vice, where I talk about like what was popular in the 80s while Miami Vice was w- was airing, I, I saw Jan Hammer cu- coming up on that Hot 100 list. I cannot wait to get to that. Yeah, so 4 million copies is pretty impressive you know i will say that just doing trying to do some research i noticed that there's a few drake albums recently released that haven't sold that many um (laughs) so views will find its point in time thank you very much (laughs) history will redeem him (laughs) we believe in you aubrey (laughs) so in february 1986 the miami vice theme would win two grammys and receive a couple emmy nominations but zero wins because He's gonna, he's gonna eat got he's gonna eat got yeah yeah um, yeah actually no no he gets close but no he does not you got uh-huh. so what what ends up happening is that he has the e he has the e and the g but he gets so wrapped up in tv and television he never makes it to stage oh okay that makes sense yep yep that makes sense there's still but time yes that would have been impressive maybe so, someone will pick it up there's still mm-hmm. time yeah he's got Apparently, he's got millions of recordings. So somewhere, someone might use one. <laughs> he doesn't even need to make any new you. music. <laughs> someone uh-huh. put up the, the Miranda uh, the thing in the sky. There's a so play that not needs only to be written would, about this man. Not only would the Miami Vice soundtrack hit number one, the Miami Vice theme hit number one. The Crocs theme would chart in other countries. The Valerie and Tubbs theme would chart in other countries, as well as a couple other songs made for certain episodes. It, it actually, Jed Hammer, it, it actually will appear in an episode coming up where he plays wedding. Uh, yes, I believe a wedding singer. Yes, and I, we totally missed that on our l- looking forward to season two. But Jenna, someone's getting married. I don't know who, but someone's getting married in season two. Why mm-hmm. do you do this to me? <laughs> so in 1988, Hammer bowed out of full-time music scores for Vice. While still occasionally receiving a credit, he started focusing on other projects. Let, let me make sure I understand correctly. He only made music for like a season or two for Miami Vice, and then they just no. reused his stuff. Well, so he would have that would mean he would have made from eighty four to eighty eight. Okay, so okay, so yeah. Almost the whole run, just not the last season. Yeah, just not the last season. At the last season, they would use like the Crockett theme and stuff that he had already composed in a few of the episodes, but he wouldn't actually make anything new for it. So he would go on. His first project after Vice was for HBO Films entitled Clinton and Nadine, and he would finish up the uh, 80s creating a theme for advertising campaign called The Runner and theme mu- music for your European television show Eurocop. Um, he would also release his album Snapshots, which would feature Jeff Beck, David Gilmore from Pink Floyd, and Ringo Starr on drum. Because <laughs> Ringo was just there and they couldn't get him out. <laughs> yes, because he just wouldn't leave the studio and they were recording in the UK. And... <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> no Just one let me play the know. drums. <laughs> John, I really appreciate your English accent. Too. <laughs> I, I, I studied the same place Tubbs learned his Jamaican accent. <laughs> so. Thank you, John Carpenter School of Acting. <laughs> Bruce Campbell School of Acting strikes there you again. Go. Yeah. <laughs> Bruce Campbell, yes. Bruce, Bruce Campbell. Campbell. I, I only go to accredited school. <laughs> 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 okay, so that brings us to the 90s to today. So, rather than name, basically, starting in the 90s, Jan Hammer, he would do a tour with drummer Tony Williams. But mostly what he would do is renew his focus on scoring about any television show, movie, or uh, I should say any TV movie that he could get his hands on, basically. And then also in 1994, he would release his first full-fledged album of new music in in years called Drive. I Basically, I just I listed out a bunch of the different TV scores and movie scores that he's done, most of which from the 90s to 2000s. So you guys ready for that? 
Let's do it. Lay it on me. So in no particular order, they would, as I mentioned earlier, they would use the Miami Vice theme in the movies Charlie's a- in the Charlie's Angels movie from 2000. Also in the Wedding Singer 1998, he would do the score for the movie The Borrower. In 1991, for the documentary Cocaine Cowboys in 2006, the movie The Corporate Ladder in 97, The Secret Agent Club with Hulk Hogan in 96. <laughs> okay, okay, hold on. I'm right. What's that one called again? I'm writing that one down. That's the one on the list the that I want to watch. The Secret Agents Club. Okay, I'm in. The Secret Agents Club, yes. Beast Master. Three, the Eye of Braxis, which was oh. a 96 TV movie. Yes, yes. A Modern Affair, 1995. Sunset Heat with Dennis Hopper in 92. The Take of Beverly Hills in 1991. K9000, which was a TV movie in 91. By the way, K9000 being a play on K9, as in a robotic dog. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, something else, Dominic, another movie you might want to write down, Dark (laughs) Angel, 1990, with Dolph Lundgren. (gasps) Okay, I'm writing that one down, too. I'm in on a, I, I love I love me the bad movies, especially with with wrestlers and former Rocky up uh, opponents. I'm in on all of those. <laughs> all right. And so, and, and jumping more to the TV side. The which TV, is why, the baby... I, will, I will say with the bad movies, which is why I will watch everything Mr. T is ever in, because he covers both uh-huh. of those checkboxes, former wrestler and a former opponent of Rocky. And he looks great in hot yes. pants. <laughs> <laughs> so yes now moving and so and there's a few others that that uh i'm skipping as far as movies but i mean there's a lot of them just so a I, ridiculous I, list yeah to jump into some of the tv stuff the vanishing sun tv series in 95 the chancer british tv show from 91 to 92 two episodes of hbo's tales from the crypt in 1990 Nice. Curiosity Kills, TV movie, 1990. I'm going to save that one for last. Hold on. (laughs) Uh, Version of the Squidbillies theme in 2014. Nice. One episode of Fringe that he performed and wrote in 2010. Two episodes of The Simpsons in 2002 and 2004. The Knight Rider 2000 TV movie. The TV movie, The Babysitter Seduction. And then just to tie everything together with all of my music segments. Alvin and the Chipmunks of Chris, uh, Chipmunk Christmas 1983. Thank you, Jan Hammer. You know, yes, it is a Jan, Chipmunk Christmas. Jan Hammer, this credit is that he he figured out that, hey, the easy streak is to make stuff that goes into syndication. Then the checks just keep rolling in. And then he also did music for two video games. The only one that you would ever have heard of is Grand Theft Auto Vice City. Going back to the 90s and 2000s, in 1991, they re-released a new remixed version of the Miami Vice theme. And then he did it again in like 2006. And so pretty much he continually makes money off of Miami Vice. Probably more money off of Miami Vice than any of the actual actors who were in the show. Well, yeah, I mean, you could imagine every episode that's ever aired in syndication, every episode that's ever been bought on a DVD or Blu-ray or bought on Amazon, like he's Mm -hmm. getting a cut of every single one of those. Not including people just enjoy the music and all of his stuff before Miami Vice existed where he was already a music god. Why does he continue to work again? I don't know. A few other things. He he actually became a citizen in 1978, which is about 10 years after he got here. And he has a son, Paul, who Damn it, there's not the a band. Jan Hammer the third. I know. I was so disappointed. So let's talk a little bit about Paul. Paul Hammer fronts the band Savior Adore and has recorded a couple albums with the help of his old dad and several funding campaigns. So Jan Hammer's son is attempting to be get into the music music industry like his old man and his old man's old man mm-hmm. so we'll see how that works out moving forward jan if he, hammer I if believe he wants to follow his, much... if he wants to follow his dad's footsteps he's got three things he's got to do pick up a really weird instrument get into jazz mm-hmm. and, and meet make Michael stuff man. for tv <laughs> yeah meet my yeah <laughs> meet a tv <laughs> producer Good to Actually, go. I was incredibly surprised at the lack of michael mann movies that were scored by jan hammer i don't think i found a single one 
Hmm. Really? Maybe one. In but... any event, this kid's gonna have to become a heart surgeon, otherwise. <laughs> right, he first, doesn't even. First, even, Jan Hammer is gonna get awful salty. Yeah, yeah, not only that, he but just, like he can't. He has to live up to the previous generations. How would you do that when you say, like, "Well, my grandfather was a musician and a freaking cardiologist, and my dad is a multi Emmy, Grammy award winning, who has made thousands of albums, worked with some of the best." people in the industry uh, lastly i will touch jan hammer can pretty much just enjoy the rest of his life and doesn't have to work uh, jenna touched on the mahavishnu orchestra uh, like literally just announcing that they're going to be getting back together I, I believe jan hammer is involved or trying to be involved in that don't quote me on that though that was an amazing journey we just went down from motherland to the u.s to working with essentially every musician in the united states that like that went way different than i thought it was going to be i thought jane hammer was gonna be like just some dude that happened to make they he got signed on to make some music for tv and it just worked out but no he was a freaking superstar before he even agreed to do Miami Vice. Always working on the back end, composing people's albums and doing stuff. So he was never the guy. He was never the lead singer in the spotlight, but he was just everywhere throughout the yeah. 70s, 80s, and 90s. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, it's just amazing. I did want to spend a moment to talk about a little bit about what we think about with Jan Hammer's music in Miami Vice. And just kind of go around re real quick and say what each of us, what we think about the music from the show. Obviously, we've talked about at length, we've talked about the music for the, the guest music, I guess you, you could call it, that come up in the episode. Let's go around. Jenna, what do you think about Jane Hammer's music and how it fits with Miami Vice and what you what you think about how that dynamic works. You know what I think speaks to the talent that he brought or like that that he was delivering with Miami Vice is that so much of Miami Vice and I know we've talked about it on previous episodes has where like the scenes were so driven by the music and I think a lot of that is like you don't even have to think about it so much of like the like the Jan Hammer orchestrated stuff that's in the back that's not like your mainstream music puts a good tone to the scene. So oh yeah, great. I would totally I would totally agree with that. And that's what my thought have been so far on season one with Jan Hammer is that I can't tell you what the music is, and that's the best part because the music fits so well with what's happening in the scenes that it's playing in that it's just part of the ambiance of the show if in the scenes where we have the popular music that comes in like you're not you're kind of paying attention less to what's happening in the scene because there's like this other great song that's playing in there like like my scene with foreigner and crockett having a call tubs and tell valerie that her sister's dead right half of my half of my attention span is paying is being paid to the music that's playing in that scene but jan hammer's music fits so perfectly it's happening scene that it's not detracting from the show it's fitting it perfectly to sum up with with what's happening in the scene and it's not taking away from it it's just adding to it it's, it's, it's almost like video game music like a video game that has really good music it sucks you so much more into the game and that's what jane hammer's music does for miami vice it's just, it's just it just sucks you into the show and there's the obvious theme song that just transcended every genre every, not every genre but every generation of tv that's like the theme song you're supposed to live up to is just how amazing the miami vice theme song is but then when you go back and listen to like crockett's theme you're like this is a really great song but when it makes its appearance in the hit list when Sonny's walking on the beach with his wife and his son and he's telling them that he has to leave and that they're going to be okay that he's going to leave them on their own you don't even notice that that's the song that's that number one billboard top song in crockett's theme that's playing while he's doing that because it just fits so perfectly yeah i think when it comes to scores at least in my opinion the best ones are always the ones that feel like natural like they were like the music could be on in the background playing on a boom box you know it just feels like it's supposed to be there Absolutely. and just kind of kind of flows with the scene what's difficult for me with with jan hammer's music and Vimey vice is is that I'm actually a fan of jazz and a fan of that type of music and some of the artists that I mentioned talking about his work with jazz artists. And it, it's tough for me being a fan of that and knowing 
what type of music and having uh, like listen to a little bit of the music that he made with them that when I hear the scores during the TV show I, I'm in, I'm incredibly pr- uh, impressed by how good he is at it and how good everything flows together but it's like child's play compared to what he's what he was doing with these other bands and like musically what he can do that's true that's totally true well i think it's time to wrap this thing up guys that was like i said sean quality research there on on the amazing life that jane hammer's had up to this point and the man is obviously capable of turning out another 700 albums in the next 10 years so i'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more from jane hammer uh even though he's not linked up with like some amazing show like Miami Vice. So that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we hope that you've enjoyed these rundowns that we've been doing of season one. We've had so much fun with season one of Miami Vice that we felt like we needed to stop and spend a few weeks giving a rundown of all of our favorite stuff from season one and this week was no exception in giving Jan Hammer his due for an entire episode which obviously he was deserving considering he's a jazz legend. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to subscribe. Check out our website go with the heat.com email us we would love to hear from you go with the heat at gmail.com you can get us on twitter and facebook as well we are going to be taking next week off we are having fun on this holiday weekend so we're not doing any recordings on the thanksgiving weekend so you won't see an episode next week but we'll be back the week after in two weeks we'll be back in two weeks with our start of season two of miami vice and i can't wait to get started and get our way back to new york and see valerie again we hope you enjoy this episode and we'll see y'all in two weeks bye pal see you next time